Well, Jim, since it is my show, I'm going to make an executive decision. It is time to now veer towards the watch along. And this is a big one. We didn't even announce what it was at the top of the show, but a match that that's your fault. It's your show. A match that continues to fascinate fans. And if you go back in time, it was the best in-ring tag team of that year, 1988, but of that generation, the Midnight Express, beautiful Bobby and sweet Stan with the best manager of that time period, Mr. Jim Cornette against now you're just trying to make things up to me, but it's a pretty amazing match against the two top in ring singles wrestlers. Many would say in the entire business in 1988 NWA world champion, nature boy, Ric Flair and the United States champion who had really come into his own that year as a heel, Barry Windham at the clash of the champion seasons beatings. Well, and that's the big thing is because it's Christmas week. Uh, we thought we would go back and and uh, this was this was kind of our most Christmassy match. And say Christmas night used to be, as we've mentioned so many times, the big night for professional wrestling live in the arenas across the country. Almost every territory had some kind of Christmas tradition. Uh, the Tennessee territory didn't really because they ran every town fifty two weeks a year, and they found that it was better to stick to their normal nights. So if Christmas night came on, you know, a, a, a Memphis or a Nashville, usually they like Nashville because then everybody could be home. But it wasn't the same. But in so many of the territories, Christmas night in the Omni or Christmas night. And as a matter of fact, we used to do uh, in the mid 80s for Crockett, a, a show either in Charlotte in the afternoon and then Atlanta that night or in Greenville, South Carolina and Atlanta that night, Greenville, South Carolina would draw 6,000 people, sell out for the Fan Appreciation Christmas Afternoon Show, and then you'd hop in the car and drive as quick as you could to Atlanta or go back to Charlotte. So, you know, Christmas was, well, then, of course, by the time that the Clash of Champions came along and TBS had just bought the company, Starcade was moved from Thanksgiving to, <laughs> to the day after Christmas that year. They didn't run... They started the tradition of not running the holidays. Um, Vince was doing pay-per-view only on Thanksgiving there for, for a while, and then that tradition stopped. Thanksgiving and Christmas, the two biggest nights of the year for live wrestling across the country, then there's no live wrestling anywhere. So that was one change. But anyway, so this was season's beatings. It was the fourth clash of champions. People have asked about my Santa Claus tennis racket cover. That was a question the other day on one of the other drive throughs It was a Santa Claus toilet seat cover that I got at Target or Walmart for Christmas and had my mother-in-law sew into a tennis racket cover. And this, they, this was the first clash under TBS ownership, so they were actually putting more promotion into it. Did, do you remember or did you ever see my commercial? That's something they've had the... The clip of me and uh, Michael Hayes doing promos for King Kong versus Godzilla on Grandpa Munster's Super Scary Saturday. I've seen that. But I've not seen my season's beatings commercial. I don't know if I've seen it. Uh, somebody's going to find it now. They ran it in regular programming on TBS to plug the Clash of Champions. They had me come down to Atlanta one day to the studio, and they had a Christmas set, and I'm sitting in a chair with my red and green, you know, suit on and the Santa tennis racket cover, and they had, they had written copy for it. It was a takeoff on Twas a Night Before Christmas, but about the Clash of Champions, and I can't remember it now except the, the end of it was season's beatings to all and to all a good fight, right? <laughs> and so, and that was the 30-second commercial they were playing a, a while before the Clash. So anyway. This was also the really the only Clash of Champions that was booked by Jimmy Crockett. This was during the period of time when they had fired Dusty as Booker. He was still on this show as a talent. They had the reason why they fired him as Booker was because he did the angle to switch the Road Warriors heel, where they put one of their spikes in his eye and tried to put his eye out. And it, it, everybody said it was the blood, but I just bled buckets. Two weeks prior to that, when Paulie hit me with the phone, and there wasn't an outrage, but it was because of the gouging somebody's eye out, and he was the booker, right? Well, he was trying to get some fucking heat on the Road Warriors and, you know, you know, kick this thing off because he was expecting to be the booker of the 
the new wrestling company that t- TBS owned. And he was trying to shoot the hottest angles, get the shit the way he wanted it. But they got hot because, it, as we would come to find out, they bought a company that sold simulated violence and then would start sending out memos the very next year on not having violence on a program about violence. So Dusty was still a talent on this show, doing an, uh, continuing the angle with the Road Warriors, but he was going to quit within what the next as ever and, and just leave within the next what was it two or three weeks after this yeah so anyway jimmy crockett had taken over because they didn't have another booker lined up and he bridged the gap from what was mid or late november whenever they fired dusty to uh when they brought george scott in later on in january jimmy crockett told me and bobby and stan to our faces, personally, I'm not a booker. I've been in the wrestling business for a long time, but I'm not a booker. I'm just going to do maintenance. We're, and, and he said that they're, they're going to get a booker. He did If he did know who it was, he didn't say at the time, but they're going to get a booker, but I'm just going to try to keep things going until then. And, of course, we had no problem with that because we, we did Jimmy Crockett of of anybody on the roster, Jimmy Crockett was going to treat us better than most anybody else because we'd drawn him a shit ton of money. So we had no problem with that. But as we've mentioned on the watch along last week on the drive through with uh, the match with me and Paul Lee, we had just started the original Midnight Midnight program that I had I had pitched the angle to Dusty. He had, he had agreed to it. He agreed to bring the guys in, Dennis and Randy and Paul Lee. So we found out later on Jimmy Crockett didn't like Randy Rose and thought that they should get Dennis another partner. So the, two things that Jimmy Crockett did for us or to us as Booker during this time was, one, he booked this match on the Clash of Champions, which I do not believe is going to take place in in dusty's mind and this was a thrill but then also he booked the loser leave town match to get rid of randy rose (laughs) for the shy town rumble in chicago in february that was his last thing he did before he handed it off to uh fucking george scott and of course george scott didn't give a shit because he didn't like us he actually told us he would have kept the other guys and fucking uh got rid of us because he had just awoke from a six-year nap so this clash of champions was the, as I said, the first under TBS ownership. And what you mentioned, Brian, was the reason why the Crockett booked this match. And it was the first time he would have ever been able to, because the Midnight Express now and I are suddenly our baby faces after the attack by Paulie and the original Midnight Express. And so we had never worked against Flair or Barry. We had done the brief thing with Tully and Arn before Tully and Arn quit in September, but we had never crossed paths with the other members of the Horsemen. And J.J. still there for a little while. He wouldn't last much longer uh, before he left, but he was still managing Flair and Barry, even though Tully and Arn were gone. So there was that bridge from that, and that program with the Midnight and Tully and Arn, as we've mentioned, for the six or eight weeks that we did it, drew some huge fucking houses, and we were making a fortune. So we were crying when they left. <clears throat> but anyway, so that was the idea that Jimmy Crockett put behind this match was it was the best in-ring tag team against the two best in-ring singles guys, Flair and Wyndham. It didn't have anything to do with our angle with the original Midnight or with what Flair and Barry were doing of uh, you know on the television programs and in the house shows. It was just it was a match for television. So I, I we loved that because anytime you got to be the main event on a Clash of Champions, this was only the fourth one. They hadn't been overdone. Anytime you got a chance to get in the ring with Ric Flair, we had worked numerous times with Barry Windham, but it was when Barry was a babyface and we were heels. So the whole dichotomy of this thing was new. When you think about it, Stan Lane hadn't been in the ring and locked up with Ric Flair this was 1988 since 1978 when Flair actually trained him to get in the wrestling business. And then I don't, they didn't have a ring. Flair was, was working out with and training Stan in, in Flair's backyard in Charlotte. 
they do the road work in their subdivision. And he had Steve Travis over there too, Steve Muslin. They do road work in their, in Flair's subdivision. And they'd work out in his, he had a home gym, but he didn't have a ring. So when they went for holes and reversals, they'd do it out in the yard by the pool or whatever. So talk about, he was, Stan Lane was trained in his backyard, but it was Ric Flair that was doing the training. They just didn't take bumps because it was the fucking yard. Um, I've told you before how Stan met Flair, didn't I? At the hotel, right? Yeah. It, Stan was working room service at the Myrtle Beach Hilton. And he's 25 years old back then. And he's fucking, he, he basically, he was living in Myrtle Beach this summer, that summer, because he was from Greensboro. But he would go out to the fucking clubs every night because he was the honorary mayor of Myrtle Beach. Sweet Stan was a thing before Stan got in wrestling. And he, the clubs would close at four or five o'clock or whatever. And he'd go to the hotel and he'd work the morning room service shift and then lay out by the pool for a while during the day and then sleep at night until it was time to go out again. So one morning <clears throat> they get a room service order for like eight bloody Marys. And so they give him to Stan and he takes him, he knocks on the door. It's fucking flair. And I'm sure Rick was not alone. It was Myrtle Beach and it was eight Bloody Marys. So he wouldn't have ordered more than six if he'd been by himself. But Flair's got a hundred dollar bill and Stan doesn't have change. And, and Flair says, I hear you go. And Stan says, I'll, I'll find you and give you the change. And Flair says, I'm going to be at the pool. So however long he goes down, he gets the change. He goes back out later on and there's Flair laying out by the pool. And now Flair's looking at Stan and, and he sees even then, as I said, when, you know, when Stan walks out, he looked like somebody. And Flair says, hey, you ever thought about being a wrestler? But what he, Stan had loved wrestling. He grew up in Greensboro, right? His favorite, George Catalina Drake, the fucking surfer guy from California. Um, and he and, and Steve Travis and Terry Taylor, who was from Greensboro, had actually worked an outlaw show that somebody asked him to get involved with, you know, like a couple of years before that. And it just, they didn't know what they were doing. And it was one of those deals. Right. But, but Stan had been a fan. He said, well, yeah, you know, I know the, you know, who this guy is now got blah, blah, blah. And he hooked up that when he moved back to uh, Greensboro in the fall or wherever, he would start driving down to Charlotte and going to Flair's house. And like I said, they'd work out together, do road work in the subdivision and Flair would teach him fucking lock up holes, reversals and smarten him up. And finally, he got a few matches after about three months or so in the Carolinas, and then they booked him out to uh, to Amarillo when Murdoch and Mulligan had taken it over from the Funks, and thus began the career of Stan Lane. But anyway, so they had never worked. And at this point in time, Bobby Eaton had never worked with Ric Flair. Um, and and we've mentioned that Flair, when he got the book, when he, when he demanded the book later on in 89, two of the matches that he booked on the TBS main event shows were him versus Bobby because he wanted to work with Bobby. So that was cool. And, and a lot of the smart fans got into this because of all these relationships. Me and JJ on opposite sides, which we had done with the Tully and Arn thing, but that, you know, gave a little more something to the package. And as I said, first time for Stan and Rick to work against each other, maybe I think ever. First time for Bobby and Rick to work against each other ever. First time for the Midnight to be baby faces and Wyndham to be heels, to be a heel working with each other. And it was the only time that this particular tag team match pairing ever happened before or since. So it was kind of cool. But then again, there was, there was the one thing is we'll see it later on. They were trying to keep the deal with me and and the Midnight and the original Midnight and Paul E going. So they were starting to play with television in those days since TBS was getting more interested now, and they started being able to do the fly-in box and everything. Well, they did the fucking fly-in interview with Paul E in the middle of the match while it's going on, and that just drove me crazy when I watched it afterwards. <clears throat> but uh, it, 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 And he was there. He taped it there. It's not like they could have just had him say this you know, right before the match started, but I digress. It, otherwise than that, uh, it was, it was pretty well received. Uh, it was odd for the midnight express because we didn't call this. The flair was good. It was a, it was a different midnight express match. And it was kind of fun because of that, because everybody gets in their patterns and you'll see 
both Bobby and Stan, not only them being baby faces, but doing different things than they normally did because Flair was calling the match. The, in those days, the heels called the match. And so therefore the midnight always called their match. But in this instance, I mean, even if we'd have still been heels, obviously we're working with Flair. He's going to fucking call it, but it, it had the guys doing a few different things than what their normal, you know, match pattern was. And and then also, that was the first time I really got to be involved in a match with Rick. I'd heard him uh, going, sitting in a corner going over things with guys before, but to just watch him actually doing it for shit, you know you're going to have to be involved in, right? I can't really fucking do it. But it, it's sort of like he's just standing there. He's like, and he'll point at you instead of saying, you know, just point. And go, okay. And then you come and you do the Zabadai and he'll make a kind of a motion. Like if you've already heard this, you, it'll remind you that you're supposed to swing something. He's going to duck and backslide. And then you do the fucking deal and the blah, 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 blah. And that's literally what he's saying. You do the fucking deal and then I'll come up and you come and boom, and we'll do that thing. And then there, that's what he's saying. And he's making these motions. So you had to fucking pay pretty close attention but then it, it just you know it, that's the that's the way he did it was like five minutes of prep we've told the story before him and steamboat would talk for less than five minutes and do 60 and other guys talk for 60 and do five and the, the talk that rick would give was not all fucking crystal clear unless you were really fucking with it <laughs> you had you just but you just followed him and it turned out okay um as far as TV ratings, I I looked in the Midnight Express book. This was before I was on the booking committee, so I I I didn't have the ratings marked down. And I'm pretty sure that if anybody has a subscription to the Wrestling Observer site, he probably had that even then. But I did look at some of the patterns of some of the the shows in that era. The Clash of Champions in those days, '88, from the first one was in March '88 and '89. And then a little bit into 90, before they started killing it off. Generally, the main event, which is what this was on this show, was seen between seen by between four and six million people. The June 1989 clash, which was right before George Scott, or right after George Scott left, and he had just decimated everything, was the worst one of all time. Worst rated of all time. And... I think the main event still probably had 3 million and change people watching the ratings, the way they gave them then for television and now have changed somewhat. So there's a slight variation. We've talked about this before. Now they'll tell you this show had such and such million or such, such hundred thousand viewers back then. And especially on cable cable and broadcast had a little bit different ratings measuring system, but they gave you the households that were watching television. Now that everything's computerized and they can pinpoint more shit. But back then it was households. And the metric that they used to determine how many people were watching in a household changed over the years. In the 1950s, it was unusual to have more than one television or maybe even to have one. So everybody in the house was watching the same program. Then as people started becoming two television households and et cetera, the number, the average number dropped. So at this period of time, television programs got credit for about 1.5 viewers per household. So if you had 3 million households, that means you had about four and a half million people by their rating system watching. Um, I pulled up the ratings. Okay, you got them there. I, I vamped long enough. From the December 19th, 1988 issue of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, covering the Clash of the Champions in Chattanooga, the card drew a 4.5 national rating in its average quarter hour, which means about 1.99 million homes. The opener, which was the Fantastics versus Ron Simmons and Eddie Gilbert, drew a 3.7 and the rating continued to grow, peaking at 5.2, which is 2.3 million homes, for the main event of Ric Flair and Barry Windham versus Jim Cornette's Midnight Express. Okay, so 
What's 50% on top of two and a half million homes? So just under 4 million people. And the, um, low, the lower rating than previous clashes was expected because for the first time it was run against big network programming, including Head of the Class and the Wonder Years. And also just one note here in case you have any memories of this. Dave wrote, I should point out this is the first time a TBS crew covered the show rather than the crew hired by Jim Crockett Promotions. Yeah. There was a lot of finger pointing after the show because the production itself was subpar, particularly at director Tommy Edwards, although some claim Edwards was made a scapegoat for problems due to lack of preparation. And then he goes on about the lighting and other things. Tommy Edwards was the the director. They ended up firing him because they played the previous weeks in 1989. Sometime they played the previous week's Saturday night TBS special TBS show over again instead of the new one that they had shot. He mixed up the tapes, um, or at least he got the credit for it. Yeah, the, uh, TBS had started the production instead of Crockett's. Pay, and you know Crockett had some. He was on a shoestring in the Nemo truck, but he had the same guys doing the same things all the time. So there's there's a value to that. Whether they were the best in the world is is debatable, but at least they knew what they were doing to get the thing done. Um. So yeah, and 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 I like by the way, and that's why Dave said, well, they only they only did four million people, but they were up against some tough network competition. You know, I I wonder if they like to apologize for 4 million people now. You think? I don't know. Also want to mention, this is a great main event. One of my least favorite matches of the era is on this show. 15 <laughs> minutes of Dr. Death Steve Williams versus the Italian Stallion. Yeah. Awful. Yeah. Just awful. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, don't, I didn't have a problem with him trying to put Doc over, but it shouldn't have taken a third of that long. But anyway, um, so there you that was the that was the business, the ratings. Um, gave you kind of the background of the the match and how this came about and why. And then uh and, and of course this was not followed up on because it was just it was it was Jimmy Crockett's standalone, we need a main event for our TBS free special. And th- he thought that this would not conflict with anything they were selling, trying to sell tickets to in the arena. What else, Brian, can you think of? Starcade two and a half weeks later. Yeah, yeah, and that's and we did have our match with the original Midnight Express, which as we mentioned on last week's drive through, we wanted to put them over and get some heat on them, but Jimmy wanted us to beat them, so they beat us up afterwards. That was the day after Christmas, Starcade in Norfolk, Virginia at the scope. Still did, as I recall, um, what was it? $180,000 or $150,000 or something. There was still life in those towns. They hadn't, they hadn't killed them yet. And this in Chattanooga here, uh, at the UTC roundhouse arena, a great wrestling town and a great building. I can't remember what the live crowd was, but it was several thousand people to, to come to see something they knew was going to be broadcast live on free television on cable. So they still had some life in the towns, but, um, it would it would take TBS a little while longer to wring all that out of everything. In a lot of ways, this clash of the champions is the end of an era. I mean, for example, on the show, you have Road Warrior Animal versus Dusty, but specifically, Ivan Koloff as a babyface yeah. against Paul Jones, and this is the end of Paul Jones's run, which had been going on forever. Jim well, Crockett it, it wasn't quite. He was going to get a reprieve because what, Crockett was no longer in control. Paul Jones was one of the guys that was grandfathered in by Jimmy Crockett Sr. Because he'd been there so long and he'd been figured in so long. But we figured, yeah, well, this is one of the changes that's going to be made. They took Paul out of managing and immediately made him an agent because they brought George Scott in to be the booker. And Paul had been George Scott's number one stooge for many, many years. So he got a reprieve for like three months. And then when they fired George Scott, Paul was the next to go. And on the topic of George Scott, there had been a lot of different rumors starting right around this period of time, but specifically right after it, that the booker was going to be Bill Watts. It was going to be Larry Matisik. A lot of different names were in the mix. And then somehow George (laughs) Scott popped up. 
And as a matter of fact, Paul Lee called. We were at the hotel in Atlanta doing a two-day TBS taping where they started instead of Saturday morning so we could go out to the shows, they started taking up two nights of the week doing two shows. So Tuesday and Wednesday, we'd be down there. He calls me in the hotel. Did you hear they named the new Booker? I said, who? Because he somehow always knew all the scoops first, right? George Scott. I said, George Scott? Because it was, it was like, you know, naming a person from beyond the grave. What the fuck? How did this come about? And he's, you know, we're in trouble. I said, what are you talking about? Name a great manager that George Scott ever used. Because it's true. He didn't use managers in the Carolinas for the most part when he was when he was booking there and in most of his runs. I said, well, Paul, and then I, I was, it was one time Paul was very perceptive. I said, <laughs> I said, well, Paul, I said, he can't really, we're signed to guaranteed deals and we're in an angle and we're two of the highlights of the television. I said, I, his hands may be tied. Little did I know he didn't care about any of that. Uh, so that's how we found out or how I found out about George Scott, but yeah, it was just, I mean, Watts would have been tremendous at that point. Larry Matizik would have been great for wrestling. And the reason why Larry Matizik was spoken about was because of the St. Louis connection. Her did know enough to know that Sam Muchnick had been the godfather of wrestling and Larry had learned from him, but Larry while for wrestling and creativity would have been, I'm sure, fine to deal with the f just the fucking personalities that were involved and would become involved, he would have gone out of his mind, and I don't think that the boys would have listened to him because they didn't. They gradually started learning not to listen to anybody else because Heard was the boss and TBS was still in charge. So I don't think it would have worked. And plus, most of those guys, I mean, Flair knew Larry, but a lot of those guys didn't even know Larry because they hadn't worked in, if, if, if Larry had not promoted in five years at that point. Is George Scott's run as Booker the most destructive short-term booking run anyone's ever had? Wow, I can't think of another one that was that rotten that quick. Like I said, short-term, not someone just killing a territory yeah. over a couple of years, but no, just, just coming in and taking something that, you know, at the handoff had still been pretty valuable and fucking it all up. Yeah. That was pretty much record time. 